Hey guys, today we're looking at the HP ProDesk 600 G1. We will take it apart and upgrade it. We will have a look at the processor, the RAM, the graphics card, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, storage, and also front bay devices. So to begin, we just open the cover and next we remove the front. Now there might be a screw here. You can just remove it. And then there are some screw holders here right on the frame. We're just gonna insert it here. And then there are three green tabs. Just pull them up and off it comes. And next we just grab this frame and pull it up. Here we have the processor socket and there's a duct. We can just pull that one aside. My machine came with the i7, the 4770. So this is a four core processor with eight threads. The machine also comes with some i5 options. We've got the 4570 and the 4670. So the main difference is the i7 has a larger cache. It's got hyper threading with four additional threads and a slightly higher clocked graphics. The mounting holes for the CPU cooler are unfortunately proprietary, so you can't install a third-party aftermarket processor cooler. The cooler by itself, however, has a standard for pinout, so you can replace it with an aftermarket cooler. It's a 70 millimeter size. In terms of RPM, I would aim for something that has around 3000 RPM. It supports PWM. You can go into the BIOS and actually set the minimum fan speed. So it will be nice and quiet if the machine is idle. And if the temperatures uh, start to rise, the fan speed will ramp up. In terms of RAM, the machine supports up to 32 gigabytes of RAM. I recommend going with 16 gigabytes. So two modules with eight gigabytes each is a very good configuration. It supports DDR3, 1600 megahertz, uh, the standard desktop version, as well as the low voltage version. And you put the memory modules first into the black slots. And if you have four memory modules, then also fill the white ones. The machine has integrated Intel HD graphics, but some configurations of this machine came with some uh, low profile video cards. We have two versions here. One is the Radeon 8490, that's this model here. And then we've got the Nvidia NVS 310. So I ran some benchmarks. First up, we have Half-Life 2 Lost Coast at 1080p with maximum details, 4x anti-aliasing and 16x anisotropic filtering. And look at that, the Intel graphics is actually faster than both the dedicated Radeon and the Nvidia card. Dirt 3 at 1080p with medium preset. Again, the Intel graphics is the fastest. The uh, NVIDIA card for some reason failed, it crashed. I'm not quite sure if this card is faulty or if it's a driver issue. I saw the same thing happening in Tomb Raider at 720p with the normal preset. Once again, the Intel HD graphics faster than the dedicated video card from AMD. Now, if you want to turn this into a gaming machine, you need a much better graphics card. It has to be low profile and not consume too much power. Now, there are a couple of options, for example, the GDX 750 Ti, the 1050 Ti, and the 1650. Those are decent video cards. The GDX 1650 is the fastest option. There is also a Radeon, the RX 6400. However, that card uses PCI Express 4.0 and only eight lanes. This machine has a PCI Express 3.0 slot with 16 lanes. You're actually better off going with the GTX 1650. It's on paper a older generation, but in this case it will perform faster. Now, I do not have a low profile video card. I'm using a desktop version with a PCI riser cable just to test and the uh, stability was perfect and we also will be talking about power draw. In Half-Life we're getting almost 300 FPS, in Dirt 3 almost 200 and Tomb Raider at 720p with the normal preset over 300 FPS. 
I get this comment all the time about the power supply. It is rated at a maximum of 240 watts and ideally you want to consume around half of the power. Um, at that level the power supply is the most efficient. Now with the i7 two memory modules of 8 gigabytes each, a SSD and this GDX 1650 in benchmarks I saw the entire computer consume between 135 to 145 watts while running Rise of the Tomb Raider the benchmark. So in my testings I had no issues with stability and we were well within the specifications of the power supply. But you might be a little bit concerned or maybe you want to install more drives and more RAM. There is a utility. This Gigabyte video card came with a utility where you can uh, reduce the power setting as well as the temperature setting and then it will draw less power. That impacts performance. Here we have a graph. We're running Rise of the Tomb Raider at 1080p with the high preset. With the video card uh, fully uh, at stock, we're getting 69.18 FPS and downclocked with the power slider all the way to the left and the temperature slider all the way to the left, we're getting 57.48 FPS. And in terms of power consumption, it went down to between 95 to 105 watts for the entire machine, which is excellent. We will continue next talking about storage devices, PCI Express expansion cards and front bay devices. But I just want to point out two features on the motherboard. If you need to reset the passwords, there's a jumper here and you basically move it uh, from this uh, main position, turn on the machine, shut down again and then move the jumper back. It will wipe the passwords and here's a button to uh, clear the CMOS and reset the BIOS options. Now with the BIOS passwords, if someone went into the, into the BIOS and configured the stringent uh, BIOS feature, if that is enabled, you cannot clear the BIOS password. Uh, the manual says, well, you have to send the motherboard back to HP. So be very careful with that BIOS option. Now installing storage should be straightforward. Unfortunately, HP decided to implement some proprietary screws. Uh, in general, with computers, there are two types of screws. We've got the 632 screws and the M3 screws. And uh, with this machine, there are two types of screws. There are ones that look like this. And then there are other ones that have a little bit of rubber inside. And uh, at the time where I bought all the parts to make this video, these were not readily available and their costs, yeah, they were quite expensive. Um, so I didn't get them. But now they are available on places like Amazon and AliExpress in both sizes, the M3 and the 632. So I will put links to basically all the parts that I'm talking about down below in the video. My machine came with a one terabyte Seagate mechanical hard drive and this is the first thing you should remove. Uh, one of the best upgrades you can do to a uh, basic or older computer is upgrading it to a solid state drive. And there are lots of options. So ideally you would get the M3 versions with the rubber mount and basically uh, install them onto the SSD. If you try to do it with the uh, 632 screws you will basically destroy the thread so be very careful you need to get the M3 versions and then the SSD basically just uh, goes into that two and a half inch drive bay down here. Another option if you don't have these screws is get an adapter this converts a two and a half inch drive into the form factor the size of a three and a half inch drive and then you can install it into the three and a half inch Bay. And doing that is quite straightforward. You have some sort of a rail here. So you just align the drive, push it down and then move it backwards like that. More flexible is the left side. These are accessible from the front. So first we have a slim slot for an optical drive. My machine came with a DVD writer, but you can also get a Blu-ray drive. And the way you install them is just from the front by sliding it in and it will then lock into place. To pull it out, there's a green latch at the back. You just need to pull it and out it comes. 
If you don't want or need the optical drive, you can get something like this. This is very nifty. This basically lets you install a two and a half inch drive and it looks like a optical drive in disguise. Basically slides into here, but lets you install a two and a half inch SSD or hard drive instead. But we still have a three and a half inch drive bay from the front and here you can do a lot of cool things. For example, this is a device from IC Dock which lets you install two two and a half inch SSDs. So I will just demonstrate that. They basically slide in from the front just like that. And at the back we have a SATA power plug and then two SATA data cables. And to install it, first you need to attach these mounting screws, open the frame, and then the drive slides in from the rear, just like that. There you go. The machine has four SATA ports. There's a dark blue one that is SATA zero, and this is where you connect your main drive that boots the operating system. The other ones you can use for secondary uh, drives or the optical drives. HP sells a USB 3 card reader. Unfortunately, the USB 3 header is already in use by the front USB 3 ports. So we have to come up with a little workaround. One option is to just go with a USB 2 card reader. They have a different connector. The motherboard has an available USB 2 port. So if you're happy with the USB 2 transfer rates, you can just buy a cheap USB 2 card reader. And I will put links for these products down below in the video description. But if you wanna use a USB 3 card reader or a USB 3 front device to get more ports, then all you need to do is get one of these. This is a USB 3 PCI Express 1X controller. And uh, this comes in a low profile bracket, which you need. So look carefully when shopping around that the low profile bracket is included and it has a USB 3 port at the back. And then you connect your Bay device to the USB 3 connector, insert the PCI Express card into the machine. It has three 1X slots, so you can actually upgrade quite a few uh, features of this machine. For example, if you want fast Ethernet, you can get a 2.5 gigabit Ethernet controller like this. Once again, make sure it comes with the low profile bracket. And you can upgrade to Wi-Fi 6. I like this adapter here because it's got an external antenna that you can uh, position to get the best reception. These ones have an Intel 802.11ax chip on there and you get much better Wi-Fi performance than with those basic USB dongles. And there you have it. With a few upgrades, you can turn this into a really useful computer, be it as a server or a media PC or even a basic gaming machine. I've been using this machine for a couple years now. It's been driving my TV in my living room, 1080p. Uh, yeah, basically a server and a media TV. Don't, not doing anything with gaming on this machine, but it has the potential. What I like about it is the reliability, the parts, everything is tested and rock solid. Do flash the latest BIOS to get all the updates. It's also extremely quiet. It has less fans than the previous model. There's only a fan in the power supply and one main fan on the CPU cooler. So yeah, really like this machine. And um, yeah, do let me know, what do you think? Maybe you've got a pro desk, maybe one of the future generations. Some of the things I showed you here also apply to uh, the replacement models. And yeah, if you find this interesting, maybe it's time for me to upgrade. I do wanna get a 4K TV and for 4K, this machine is not quite cutting it. The Intel graphics doesn't have all the latest uh, video acceleration and the processor. Yeah, it would be nice to have a more modern uh, i5 or i7 with six cores. That would be interesting and DDR4. But yeah, really happy with these HP machines. They're cheap as chips. You can get them for around 100 Australian dollars. So in the US, very likely even less and a lot you can do. I really like uh, tinkering with them. So yeah, and yeah, to support the channel, have a look at the links down below in the video description. Uh, there's a small uh, commission that goes my way, but it doesn't cost you anything, so why not? And that's it, guys. Let me know what you think. Leave a comment down below. Always eager to hear from you. 
and I shall see you soon with another one.